<clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for joining. We'll, we'll just allow our moderator to let everybody into the room here from the from the Zoom waiting room, and we'll get started in just a minute. Uh, thank you for joining. All right. Good. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, depending on, on where you are. Uh, my name is Alan Levine, Executive Director of Hasbro Fellowships. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for, for joining us here. Uh, for those who, who may be newer here, uh, I'll just take a moment to just introduce who we are and, and who's in the room here at Hasbro. Uh, we've been uh, working on college campuses now for, uh, for over 20 years uh, in empowering and training Jewish and other pro-Israel students to stand up uh, against uh, the anti-Israel propaganda the anti-Semitism that we see on college campuses. And uh, unfortunately, the last couple of weeks has been a real reminder of why we have to do what we do. Um, and, um, and we believe in, in education. We believe in, in Jewish and pro-Israel students knowing exactly what is going on uh, in Israel. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, the reason here for the briefings we've been holding since October 7th. And, um, and so we have here on the line, we've got Hasbara Fellows from uh, around the U.S. and Canada. We have alumni, we have parents, and we have uh, those of you who make our work possible from our from our donor network. And uh, I want to thank all of you, everybody on the line here for taking the time. Uh, and, um, and I want to introduce our guest speaker. We'll, we'll jump into it here. We have a lot to cover. And uh, Laser Berman, diplomatic uh, correspondent for the Times of Israel. Uh, Laser, thank you for joining us. And, and I'll just take a minute to, to introduce you by uh, by saying this, and, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with your work, reading your your work in Times of Israel, and following you on social media. Uh, and, and those of you who who, if you may not have read Laser's work yet, I definitely recommend that you do. Um, I'll just introduce you by by saying this: last time you were on with us a couple of months ago, uh, we talked about your trip with the Foreign Minister of Israel to India. We talked about how you were in Ukraine uh, four times, I believe. Uh, you were with Prime Minister at the time, former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett on his trip to Washington. We talk about all these things and they all seem like a different lifetime. It's like no one can fit any of that in their head these days. We're, we're worried about Gaza. We're worried about uh, the safety of Israelis in the South and, and, and all hoping for a very quick victory here for the IDF in, in Gaza. And, um, and so it's, it's, you know, just a little eerie how the world has changed since last time we talked, but um, can't think of anybody better to to come and uh, and really enlighten us here. Uh, now you've been in the South at some of the kibbutzim that were attacked on October 7th, and you've been with uh, IDF troops uh, on the Gaza border and on the northern border, and you're now at the Times of Israel headquarters uh, in Jerusalem. So um, thank you, Laser. Thank you for joining, and uh, we have a lot of questions for you. Great, uh, thank you. And just as a way of opening before we get into the questions, um, I want to thank your organization, Hasbro Fellowships, and I also want to thank the uh, the college students. I know you all have uh, work, social lives, and I know it's not an easy time to be a college student um, on some of these campuses. There are many fronts in this war. There's obviously the soldiers who are doing wonderful, uh, dangerous, uh, difficult work, but they're, they're doing good work. Um, moving uh, through the Gaza Strip and, and, and dealing with the Hamas threat. There are diplomats, Israeli diplomats. There are, of course, all the volunteers that you've seen in Israel who are doing amazing things as well, supporting the soldiers, supporting the families, supporting the victims, supporting the families of the hostages. But of course, none of this can happen if the world is not behind us. So the fact that all of you are taking your time uh, to be more educated, to advocate, uh, to help spread the truth is something that in Israel, uh, we pay attention to, uh, it matters to us, um, it touches us, and, and it's certainly a struggle. Every, every, you know, there, there's a unique struggle that people are facing in Israel, there's a unique struggle that soldiers are facing, but you're facing your struggle as well. So uh, I personally appreciate it, and I know that many Israelis do as well, so thank you. Thank you for that, and, um, and, and yes, certainly our focus here at Hasbara are the college campuses, but um, we have Israel very much in our in our prayers at the moment, and, and we need to be as educated as possible here. Um, and so I, I want to start by just, um, well, I'll just start by giving a quick outline and telling the audience. I want to ask you about kind of lots of topics. Um, militarily, what is the update? Um, I want to ask you about 
Nasrallah's speech and what what Hezbollah and Iran's role is in all, in all of this uh, diplomatically, how Israel is doing. Um, and so I want to get into all those topics, but I want to start by just um, talking a little bit about October 7th itself. And I think um, from our perspective as pro-Israel student leaders on college campuses, we, we have to just keep reminding the world about what happened on October 7th. And, and we can't allow uh, our detractors to get us into a debate on their terms where we're defending, you know, that it's, it's a tit for tat and you say, well, Israel did this. And, and then we have to say, well, this is the reason, right? We, we've got to reframe uh, and I think remind people that just the basics, this conflict is about uh, Hamas wanting to kill Jews. Their, their charter says it, that since they were founded, it says we are here to kill Jews. It says uh, the day of judgment will not come until the, Jew, the Muslims kill the Jews, right? That is in their charter. And when they had the chance on October 7th, they not only kill Jews, they, they beheaded, they, they, it's graphic, but, but I think we have to keep reminding our campuses of this. Uh, they, they put a baby in the oven. They, they killed parents in front of children and killed children in front of, of parents. They live streamed murders of, of grandmothers. Uh, and of course, we, we, there are 240 hostages uh, still in Gaza here. And so um, I just want to, I'd be remiss if we didn't start by just mentioning that. And um, and just getting your your reaction, Laser, and and what it was like for you to go to some of these sites that were uh, part of the October seventh Simchat Torah massacre. Absolutely, and and I'll say just personally, I mean my own my own understanding of the world and, and the way the world works, uh, also on some religious levels as well. I'm a religious person, but all all that changed in some way, shifted um, after October seventh. It's as if all the terrible things that man has done to man throughout history and that uh, anti-Semites have done to Jews throughout history were all compressed into one morning, into one place. Uh, it's, it's really nothing like I've ever seen before. And what makes all the cruelty even more abominable is the fact that they took so much pride in doing it. I mean, uh, you know, you could even say, you know, Nazis, you know, obviously should be wiped away from history, even though we should always learn the lessons from what happened there. But there was even some level of, uh, you know, an attempt to, to try to hide their, their genocide and their crimes. But you see these, these terrorists who are just taking pride in it, calling their parents and, and bragging how many Jews they killed. It wasn't about settlers. It wasn't about Israelis. It was about Jews. There's no question. It becomes even more real, of course, when you're there. Um, and, and I apologize, you know, for being a bit graphic. I won't, I won't get too graphic, but uh, the smell. I mean, I was in uh, Kibbutz Beiri three days later. There's still uh, terrorist bodies just, you know, uh, being found. There were still, um, there were still victims. Um, I think Israel was very good about, you know, taking, making sure that, that journalists weren't seeing the bodies of the victims. Um, but they were still some who were caught under the, the, the buildings and, and that rescue forces were still going through. You know, the smell is the first thing. It's the smell of death. There's no, there's no uh, hiding that. House after house, every house tells its story. You can see the blood stains on the wall. You could see what the victims were doing in their homes the minute uh, terrorists burst into their homes and either ended their lives or changed their lives forever. Something that certainly sticks with me is the fact in house after house, you go and you these houses are, are basically destroyed now, but you go into a children's bedroom and you see in every single one, the crib or the kid's bed is, is lifted up. It took me a second to realize, but that the terrorists were going looking for the kids. Um, and I'm sure they, they, that was a place where, where they found kids, you know, it's where kids hide. If their parents weren't able to take them to a safe room, that's where kids tend to hide. Every single house, you know, had, had these kids, had these beds lifted up. It's just, you know, another detail of, of the horror on the horror. Um, uh, yeah, and just the, the scale of destruction. You, I mean, you just—it looks like something. If you've seen pictures of, of World War II, the bombed-out cities, these little kibbutzim, beautiful places, and there's some element of the beauty still there because there's animals running around. The fields are still fields, but the houses are just, you know, burnt, destroyed. All these places, you know, only hours before or days before, were places where people were going through some of the worst terrors that someone could imagine. Um, and, and, you know, and the signs of it were there. And then, of course, when you speak to the rescuers and the people that got there on the day of, um, people that got to the burnt out cars in Raim and what they witnessed there is just, you know, I'm sure that, that uh, everyone who's listening understands what happened there, but when you see it, when you smell it, 
when you can feel it, um, you know, that's certainly a different aspect to it and something I'm sure the Jewish people will never forget. Friends of, of the Jews will never forget and hopefully the world will never forget, even though there are some signs that some people uh, would like to move beyond it very quickly. Yes, and unfortunately on college campuses, we're, we're seeing some people not, not that they're forgetting, they're trying to erase it. You know, we're, we're hearing it routinely now, though, though there's no proof, these are lies, well, or, or it was resistance, uh, or both. It didn't really happen, but if it did, it would be resistance and justified, uh, which is absolutely appalling. And um, and, and we as, as Jewish leaders and, and pro-Israel leaders, um, we, we have to make sure the world never forgets and, and, and we have to continue to frame our discussions around this. It's, it's you know, they on social media and, and on the pages of your student newspapers on campus itself, they, they want you to be in a discussion uh, about what the term occupation means and, and, and what excessive force is and the laws of war. And, and we have to make the discussion about this. Uh, Hamas, it, it, you know, make the make the, the the bad guys defend it right you you do you believe in executing babies because that's what Hamas is for and they showed us um so we, we I want to move on to to the geopolitics of it all to the to the war uh, etc what's moving forward but um but um I think it's just important to spend a few minutes on that especially if we as we uh pass the shloshing the 30 days of of uh uh, th those those uh, events. Um, Ezra, talk to us a little about uh, what's happening in Gaza itself, the army's progress here, and uh, the recent headline is the army has managed to cut the Gaza Strip in half, um, right? And uh, meaning the army has reached the beach uh, and uh, is now created a uh, a uh, they control a corridor here from from east to west, right? And so. Effectively, now there's a North Gaza Strip and a South Gaza Strip, and talk to us about the significance of that. Yeah, so the, let's talk about the military campaign in general. Uh, from day one, Israeli leaders promised that they would take out Hamas, that they would uh, topple their civ civil uh, leadership of, of, of the or governance of the Gaza Strip, and that they would make sure that mm -hmm. the, the Hamas military capability would be, would be destroyed. They can no longer threaten the lives of Israeli citizens. For the first uh, say, you know, almost three weeks, it didn't seem like there was much movement on that. There was, the first stage was to uh, clean the area of terrorists to make sure that there were no terrorists still in the, uh, still in the communities, you know, thousands got in and, and there were some that were there days afterwards. So that was the first, um, that was the first uh, task that had to be completed. The next was this extended air campaign. It was, all, it was focused on uh, taking out Hamas leaders and terrorists, uh, dealing with some of their rockets, but most importantly, preparing the ground for the uh, introduction of ground forces. Uh, this is going to be, and this is a fight in urban environments. And if you look at other Western militaries, whether it's the US, the UK, uh, NATO forces, Ukraine also in, in cities, it's the most difficult type of warfare. A lot of the advantages of a modern Western military are negated when you're uh, in these small areas. Um, these buildings are in the way. The defenders have a lot of advantages. It's as if, you know, if they were going to build a fortress uh, the size of Gaza City, it would take even the United States years to build. And they have this already built for them. Even if you knock down buildings, you know, they can still use them as defenses. A very difficult type of warfare. There were some warnings, some attempts from even the United States, from Friends of Israel, trying to convince Israel not to do a ground invasion. They were saying, from our experience, listen, you're going to get swallowed up by these big cities. The casualties are going to be high. Try to do it a different way. Um, Israel, and I think rightly so, and I've written this, was very determined that the only way to do this is to get boots on the ground, tanks on the ground, and to uh, start uprooting, destroying the tunnels, uprooting the defensive positions, and really take going slowly and deliberately. Since the ground invasion started, the ground incursion started, um, I think it's gone better than people even expect. There's been 30 casualties in the ground forces. Um, there was 11 just from one strike on an armored personnel carrier. Every loss, of course, is painful and is tragic. But if you're looking at uh, more than a week of ground combat in a very complex environment, an environment where the enemy had um, years, more than a decade to prepare, it's going well. Uh, Israel is able to dominate, is to decide what happens when they're able to move at their pace. 
Um, Hamas is not putting up any effective defense other than local ambushes. Now, those can, are dangerous. Those have to be dealt with. But they're not able to, to, to impose their will on what the IDF does. The IDF wanted to move slowly from the north, the 162nd Division, into Gaza from the northern suburbs. That's been done. Uh, the 36th Division uh, to cut across to the sea to cut off Gaza City from the south. That's been done. There, there's no there's no way that Hamas was able to stop it. So indeed, Hamas, um, the Hamas headquarters in Gaza City, the main city in the Gaza Strip, is cut off and surrounded. But here's an important caveat. It's surrounded on the ground. Beneath the ground, there are other roads and there are other corridors. Those are not destroyed yet. That city under a city uh, still remains. Some of that has been dealt with by bombs from the air, from, from the work of the engineers, but that still remains. I'm sure that Hamas is able to still uh, move troops and move um, weapons into Gaza City, and it will take many weeks before that is totally cut off. Um, many weeks, huh? And, and is there, I mean, I know no one can uh, can predict, but but is it is it a fair understanding to say we it's going well, but the tests are getting harder and harder. Is that uh, what we're what we're hearing? It's, it's it'll be tougher combat now going forward. Not necessarily. It's certainly the closer you get to what the enemy, uh, what Hamas sees as important, the more vigorously he'll defend it, right? And as he gets uh, surrounded and compressed into smaller and smaller space, he can't keep retreating and doing these hit and, uh, hit and run attacks. On the other hand. But there is an effect, um, kind of a cumulative effect, that at some point, some uh, organization, some systems break apart. And with the, the elimination of a lot of uh, pallian level commanders, um, it seems like some of those systems are starting to come unraveled on the Hamas side, that the size of the uh, ambushes are smaller, it's more one, two people, and they're not these big things that they tried at the beginning. So it could actually get easier in some ways. Um, and don't forget, after Israel finishes with the northern Gaza Strip, there's the central Gaza Strip, there's the southern Gaza Strip. All of that has to be dealt with in time. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. Um, but from what I can tell, and I was I was with Netanyahu yesterday, the determination is there. That's um, certainly encouraging. Um, which I know you were in a briefing with the prime minister yesterday with 30 other journalists. Um, tell us a little bit about what was said, um, what, what uh, and if you, if I could ask you kind of personally, uh, how does the prime minister, uh, does he, uh, how does he look during, during this war when you're with him in the room? Um, and uh, anything he may have told you that you want to share with us? Sure. Um, so I've done a, a bunch of these briefings with the prime minister. This is the first one he's given us during the war. I think it was too long to speak, to wait to speak to, to Israel's diplomatic corps. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do more of these. It was in the Kiryan Tel Aviv. It was in the IDF headquarters. It was not in Jerusalem, the prime minister's office. Uh, he looked tired, but he looked determined. It seemed like, you know, he, and he said this as well, that he's only focused on one goal. He's not focused on the politics. And, you know, plenty of Israelis disagree with that. But he said he's focused on winning this war and nothing else. Um, yeah, and he was, you know, was eloquent. He was... Um, was focused, but he, he spoke at length. He, he, he really did speak at length. Um, a lot of what he said was off the record, so I can't really share it, share it in this forum. Um, but there was certainly, you know, he, he likes to read history. His father was a historian. He spoke a lot about um, how he, he sees Hamas leader uh, Yichia Sinwar as kind of this messianic figure, kind of like Hitler in the bunker at the end, where Hitler was starting to blame the German people, saying, if Germany, if we lost this war, it's because the German people deserve to die. They didn't they didn't resist strong enough. So he, he, he thinks Sinwar is kind of that type of, of character, does not care about the Gazan people, uh, sees them as an asset in terms of defending Hamas capability. And if they die, they die. And if they don't, if they do, uh, you know, start fleeing uh, to different places, that means they deserve to die because they're not standing up for the cause. Um, and, you know, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. That's, that's kind of what Sinwar, uh, the military leadership of Hamas thinks. Um, so he was very adamant about that. Um, but we had an hour with him, and then he had to go to different meetings. His top aides were there as well. Ron Dermer, a lot of people have seen. He's an American. He's Israel's ambassador in Washington. He spoke with him at length as well. Um, so, yeah, um, you get a sense of, of the, the uh, work that they're putting in, and that's in between me meeting the world leaders that are coming to Israel as well. Um, almost every 
ally of Israel has sent the world leaders. The big one we're waiting on is Zelensky, Ukraine's president, a Jewish, probably the most famous Jew in the world. Um, he's supposed to come at some point as well. There's talk he might come tomorrow, but that story leaks, so maybe he won't come tomorrow. But uh, that I'm hoping he does come because I think it's an important symbol. Uh, Ukraine has become the symbol of the West or democracy struggle against other forces. And I think Israel is starting to take that place as well to see the two leaders together, I think would be important. Wow, fascinating. Um, talk to us a little um, about Hassan Nasrallah's speech, the, the Hezbollah leader in, in Lebanon. It seems like um, most of the analysis of his speech is that he's sort of finding a, a very long way, long-winded way to say, we're not going to jump in to this, but we, but we're very tough. Is, is that sum it up uh, fairly? And, and what do you make of, of their, uh, the speech and, and, and Hezbollah's kind of position in all of this? So I think a lot of people wished he had basically said it in those words because uh, he's, he's, he's nothing if not long-winded. He's also a terrorist. He's also has a blood of a lot of people on his hands. He's also an Iranian uh, proxy, but uh, he does know how to give long speeches. Uh, people around the world were listening to it to try to get an indication of what is Hezbollah going to do. That was the big question. Hamas, I'm sure, would like to see pressure relieved on them, have Hezbollah join from the north. Um, and he really did what he does. He didn't give any indication. Um, I think his speech was less mm, strident, less aggressive than some people had expected. But let's not forget, uh, Hamas for years gave this impression that they wanted to come to long-term ceasefires and then uh, carried out the butchery of October 7th. So everything that one of these leaders says has to be seen through the prism of uh, one of our, the audiences is Israel, uh, you know, their big enemy, so they can be trying to, to play with us as well through psychological uh, warfare. He has other audiences. He has the Lebanese people. Hezbollah always presents themselves as the real defenders of, of Lebanese people. It's hard for him to present himself as that if, if he is bringing destruction on Lebanon. And you've seen other uh, Lebanese political figures saying, if Hezbollah drags the whole country into war, it'll be the greatest you know, sin in the history of the country. All the blood of the Lebanese will be on his hand, those type of ideas. Um, so there's certainly not a lot of appetite in Lebanon to have Beirut look like Gaza. Um, also, another uh, audience of his is in I Iran. You know, uh, Iran sees Hezbollah as one of its most important assets. Iranians are always happy to have tens of thousands of Arabs die for, for Iran. Then they don't have to get their own hands dirty. Um, the question is whether they think it's a good idea for their biggest asset to attack when the IDF and Israel is fully mobilized. You know, the, Hamas's big advantage on October 7th was they took Israel by surprise on a holiday. To attack now when Israel uh, you know, has its guard up and is fully mobilized and is, is angry and ready uh, is probably not the best idea. There have been this, these fights across the border, a lot of rocket fire from Hamas and Hezbollah from the north, some of it fatal. Um, but uh, Israel seems to be getting, clear, not seems to, is clearly getting the, the, the uh, upper hand here. It's, I think Hezbollah has admitted to 50 dead uh, Hezbollah fighters. Um, from I, from these exchanges, so uh, we're doing uh, well in that regard. Question is, it's such a, a delicate balance. What mistake will be made? You know, if they fire and it kills a lot of Israeli civilians, we might have no choice. Um, or you know, some someone on on the Hezbollah side might, might say, you know, this we built up all this military strength. This is the time to use it. Israel is is tottering, they might think that. So this is very tense, but um, to make no mistake, Israel is fully mobilized on the northern border as well as it is on the south. You know, it, it is, you know, half the army is up there, or maybe more than half is, is on the northern border. So it is ready to move into Lebanon, you know, tonight if, if Hezbollah decides that it wants a war. Right, and I know you spent time with the uh, IDF soldiers in the north uh, here over the last couple of weeks, so you, you know of what you speak. Um, and you know, Israel, I actually want to ask you about how, what does this all look like from the war room in Iran, right? They, you would think that they wanted an eventual war with Israel uh, where Hamas and Hezbollah are fully mobilized at the same time, uh, perhaps at a time in the future when, when, from their perspective, when they develop their nuclear weapon, right? Um, and it seems like they're about to lose 
a major asset in Hamas in Gaza here. So was this, is this not what Iran wanted? Did Hamas uh, kind of step out of line uh, there? Did, did Iran, did they have Iran's blessing, but something went wrong? What, what do you make of, of kind of Iran's read on all this? Yeah, um, let's make no mistake, Hamas doesn't exist without Iran. Uh, weapons, training, tactics inspiration, all of that is Iranian. Do I think that uh, October 7th was Iran telling Hamas what to do? No, I, I don't. I don't. I think, uh, you know, they were training for something similar to this, but the actual decision of what it was going to look like and when it happened was uh, a Hamas decision. Uh, what is, you can see that Iran is, you know, sees an opportunity here. Their big goal, and this is Russia's goal as well, by the way, is to get the United States out of the Middle East. Right. And that was a trend that was going on. It was a bipartisan trend, basically starting from Obama through Trump and Biden until October 7th was to move uh, American forces out of the Middle East to focus on issues at home and to focus on China. That was very comfortable for Iran. It was very comfortable for Russia. It was also comfortable for China. Iran is trying to force the last American troops out of the region. You've seen these um, attacks by Shiite militias, Iranian you know, back the Iranian supplied Shiite militias trying to, uh, you know, force Iran, uh, American troops out of the region. Um, but what we're seeing is American troops are coming back to the region. You have two carrier strike groups. You have the USS Ford and you have the USS Eisenhower and you have this nuclear submarine on the way. This is a lot of firepower. This is basically two normal countries, air forces in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, that's not good for Iran. So I think Iran understands that, uh, you know, America is moving back in and it feels like it needs to strike and kind of uh, make it too costly for Biden, for the Americans. It seems like the Biden administration is determined uh, to maintain its presence. They've even said that if Hezbollah gets involved, that American forces will get involved as well in Lebanon, which is something that is uh, very surprising. It's kind of hard to imagine. Um, but, you know, they, they brought that up. I don't I didn't hear in any way that that was an Israeli request. Um, so they seem very serious about deterring, about keep this, keeping this from spreading for sure. Um, but once you speak like that, you really have to back it up. We've seen what happened when America doesn't do that. Um, so yeah, Iran is, is certainly a part of this. They certainly don't want to be struck um, in, on Iranian territory. They don't want Iranian forces to be struck. That's why they've developed these proxies all across the region so other people can bleed for them. So do you, just to follow up, and I know nobody can know the answer to this question, but if the U.S. aircraft carriers were not there, would we see a bigger Hezbollah uh, involvement in this in this war? Um, what does your gut say on that? Probably slightly. I still don't think that you know that's what's keeping Hezbollah from being involved. Um, most of the damage that Hezbollah would suffer if it decides to get involved would be from Israel. And Israel's here no matter what. Um, but when you add the American angle to it, it also makes uh, Iran think twice um, about, about what would happen to Iran if uh, if indeed Hezbollah got involved. And, and obviously the prospect of America being involved, not that their firepower is bigger than what Israel has in the region. Israel obviously has more assets in the region. But without America even trying to hold Israel back, I think that is not something that uh, Hezbollah is looking forward to. And they know that what will happen to the Lebanese state um, will probably also be built, uh, blamed heavily on Hezbollah and will undermine their ability to claim to be the defenders of Lebanon when they're showing that they're just the destroyers of Lebanon. I want to switch gears a little bit. You are uh, the diplomatic correspondent for the Times of Israel. I want to ask you about diplomacy. How how um, How is this going diplomatically? I mean, it's, it seems like Israel had most world leaders in their corner uh, at the beginning. Um, there were a few hiccups like the hospital situation where unfortunately uh, even Western countries condemned Israel before even finding out the truth, right? Tell us a little bit just about your read on on um, on the diplomacy. What's the thinking uh, in, in Jerusalem diplomatically? Yep. So the big thing that I think Israel has to um, avoid is real pressure for a ceasefire, right? A ceasefire means that Hamas uh, either can regroup or lives to fight another day. Fight another day means killing more Israeli civilians and doing all the terrible things they did. 
Um, as of now, there are no real calls for ceasefire. Uh, around the world, there are, certainly are. There are some kind of fringe voices uh, on the far left of the Democratic Party, but even at Bernie Sanders saying that a ceasefire would not, you know, would be basically uh, given into Hamas. They're not people that you can have a ceasefire with. So that's significant. Um, America is the country that really matters here, right? America can block problematic things that Russia and China are doing uh, on the UN Security Council. They're the dominant force, you know, in, in what happens in the West. As long as the Biden administration is is with Israel on this, then uh, Israel is comfortable and it can keep doing what it needs to do. But you, I'm sure your listeners and you know people here will will notice and, and will think about what about these temporary pauses or what BB calls a temporary ceasefire? Isn't that kind of a move in that direction? Yeah, it might be. There is a danger there, um, but at the same time, Israel has to make sure that it is uh, basically recognizing that. President Biden is putting out his neck for Israel in an election season. Uh, his poll numbers are not great. And he's still doing this for Israel. And I think Israel realizes that it needs to it needs to, to cooperate in that regard. This makes things more comfortable for him. It also makes it easier in Europe to show that um, Israel is doing what, it's, what it can to get civilians out of the combat zone um, and to let humanitarian aid into Gaza Strip. Even though it comes from Egypt, um, it's all being inspected by Israel. It's also, in terms of Israel's own interests, it's better that uh, there are these pauses because it doesn't want any civilians to be in the northern Gaza Strip. Even if someone says Israel doesn't care about civilians at all, et cetera, et cetera, which it does. Um, but even if you want to be cynical, it doesn't help Israel's uh, war effort to have civilians in the way, getting in the way of what the troops are doing, and bringing more pressure on it internationally. So there's no question that these pauses, if it can help people get south, the better the situation is in the South, the better there is the situation is in terms of food, water, medicine. Um, that is better for Israel. There's no question about that. Of course, there's limits. There's limits because Hamas still has those, you know, still operating in the South, and um, and it uses hospitals as as military bases. So these are all making the, the work much more complex. But so far, it seems like things are good. You might have seen though that countries like Turkey have recalled ambassadors. Okay. Okay, you know, we'll be fine without the Turkish ambassador here. Um, the Abram Accord countries are an interesting one. Um, well, let's, let's start with Egypt and Jordan first, because those are the oldest Arab allies. Egypt, biggest enemy that Egypt has is the Muslim Brotherhood slash Hamas. Uh, that's the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they would love nothing more than for Israel to wipe out Hamas. But of course, they have to be uh, receptive to what the street thinks. The Egyptian street is no fan of Israel or the Jews, really. Um, so therefore, they have to show that they are working to uh, to restrain Israel, to allow humanitarian aid in. Jordan also, Jordan, you know, is certainly on Israel's side in terms of what the royal family and the leadership wants. But with a with a a population that's more than fifty percent Palestinian, they really have to be critical of Israel, and they have been. Um, and the Abraham Accord countries have actually been quite good. They haven't recalled their ambassadors. They too would like nothing more than for Israel to do what it wants with Hamas. But they have to be attentive to their street, and they can't be seen as um, as a party to the death of Palestinians. So they have been critical publicly, but again, privately, you haven't seen um, any major steps, and they're, they're certainly not moving to break off the Abram Accords. Interesting. And and later, talk to us a little about um, diplomatic conversations surrounding what the day after looks like in Gaza. Uh, seems Tough like. One. And I'm not sure the Israeli leadership has that fully thought out yet. Um, you know, there's some red lines that Israel will, if it sees a threat, it will be able to deal with it. So the, the talk was about, uh, it was termed as ultimate security uh, influence, I think was the terminology that I heard in Gaza. What that means, it could be like Area B in the West Bank, that Israel's security forces can go in and out. Um, the Palestinian Authority obviously has to be, I think, the long-term solution there, even though they're not... They're not good for much, but they are decent at keeping the West Bank relatively mm -hmm. quiet. Um, the question is, how do you get them in there? Because they can't be seen as riding on Israeli tanks into the Gaza Strip. So there's going to have to be some uh, a period of years, probably, before that happens. And then who is in the Gaza Strip? First of all, the Gaza Strip has to be rebuilt physically. Uh, the education system has to be overhauled so they're not being educated that you know, killing Jews is a good thing. 
and which means the UN schools probably have to be replaced. And then you need uh, people administering the city and keeping uh, security control. It would be wonderful if countries like Saudi Arabia wanted to get involved. I'm not sure that would happen. Maybe even uh, NATO countries. Again, this is a big ask to stick your forces in a, in a place like Gaza. But let's not forget, in southern Lebanon, which is no joke either, you have a lot of international players which are not Middle Eastern, Fiji, Ireland, things like that. So uh, there are models, but it will be complex. And I do not get the sense that anyone has fully uh, figured this one out yet. But just to follow up on that, it sounds, I mean, what, one comment I noticed, Secretary of State Blinken uh, made the first comment on behalf of the administration about four or five days ago about uh, what he believes Gaza should look like after the war. And he said a revitalized Palestinian authority, uh, I believe his words were, needs to play a role, PA. And then I, I saw a story in Times of Israel that an unnamed official in, in Israel said, Israel will have to have uh, ultimate security responsibility yeah. uh, in the Gaza Strip. So it, it seems like there's some pre, uh, some jostling here, some some sort of uh, position, sending out, making some remarks here to kind of mark out uh, diplomatic positions. Um, and, um, and I wonder what the thinking is right now in, in Israel. I mean, if, if, if it, it does seem like it has to be Israeli control in some you know, on some level, right? It has to Israel has to ultimately be involved to, to keep Israelis safe, right? Yeah, I think it, uh, the focus on Israel is winning the war, first of all. Um, but you know, it, has, it is a question that should be asked. And and I think if you think about Area B in the West Bank, whereas the Palestinian Authority has civil daily control, and Israel has security, if there's a threat, Israel's forces, whether it's you know the mm -hmm. army or police or Shin Bet will take care of those. I think that's probably the model we'll see at the beginning. Nothing would make Israel happier than for the Palestinian Authority to be effective security partner and deal with all those threats itself. But that's unfortunately not the case entirely in the West Bank and it will be much harder for it to be so in Gaza because of course there is sympathy for Hamas in Gaza. Uh, there might even be more sympathy after this war. It depends you know, where public opinion goes, whether they blame Hamas for bringing this on them. Or blame <laughs> Israel. Um, but certainly it was, a, it was a stronghold of Hamas. Um, so that will be not it will not make life easier for the Palestinian Authority to rule there. Um, let's not forget, in 2007, now within the Gaza Strip at the time, um, Hamas threw PA, so Fatah fighters and, and, and civilians off of roofs and shot them and, mm -hmm. and did all sorts of terrible things to them, as we know they are capable of doing. So, uh, you know, the, there is a, a blood feud between these, these Palestinian groups as well. So I want to open up to the audience here just to, to get some Q&A. And if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Or if you want to uh, come on and ask it, just click reactions at the bottom and raise your hand and I will I will uh, call on you. Uh, so please uh, start preparing your questions here. And I'll just ask my final one, which will just be to follow up um, with you later. Just to, to explain to everyone uh, a refresher uh, and the Hasbara fellows learn all about this when we're in Israel, but uh, in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, there's area A, area B, area C. You referenced area B here, but just a quick reminder of what, what each of those mean. And um, and that'll be important just for everyone to gain an understanding of what you're saying the future might be in, in Gaza. Sure. So under the Oslo Accords, um, the West Bank and, and Gaza Strip, but more relevant right now for the West Bank, because that's where the PA is, um, we're split into three types of territory. So area A, where the Pal Palestinian Authority has full civil and security control. Um, so those are like the main Palestinian cities, Ramallah, Jenin, Nablus, Jericho. Um, there's area B, where Palestinian Authority runs the civil affairs. You know, there's all the collecting of garbage and the permits and everything, and Israeli forces uh, take care of security control. And then area C, where so all the Jews who live in the West Bank, all the settlements are in Area C, and then there's also uh, tens of thousands of Palestinians who live there as well. So Israel has civil control and uh, and security control, and that was based on the agreement between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. The vision was that eventually it would be transferred to all to Area A, but that obviously didn't happen. Um, so if it's Area B, that would mean that uh, in the Gaza Strip, that would mean the PA is running. You know the cities and getting the water and the sewage and all that, 
and then Israel, if it has threats to go in and out, it might be a mix, it might be a mix, but again, this is not fully flushed out. Okay, um, let's see questions coming in here and I will choose them. And again, if you'd like to ask your question uh, on camera here, just raise your hand, which you can do uh, by clicking the uh, reactions button and then the uh, hand icon there. Um, and uh, actually, uh, Interesting question here, which is um, a question just about Palestinian Christians. Um, and uh, are there any left in Gaza? And I think it's a, a very interesting question to, to ask here because we, we're having to remind our audience on campuses of, of Hamas's fanatical hatred of Jews here. Maybe you can, maybe I'll broaden your question there, Roy, and, and just ask what, what is Hamas's treatment been of Christians? Um, and uh, is there anything we should kind of keep in mind? as we, we talk about that on campuses. Sure. Um, yeah, so there are about, I think a thousand Christians left in the Gaza Strip. Um, there was a church that I believe there was an, in the first week there was an IDF strike near the church and it caused some of it to collapse. And, and that was certainly something that brought a lot of uh, ire on, on Israel. Um, the, mm -hmm. there were thousands more, it was over 5,000 when uh, Hamas uh, took over the Gaza Strip by force in 2007. You can see the number, <coughs> right? So, and it's also true in the West Bank. Uh, Palestinian Christians have uh, left, uh, whether it's to Europe, whether it's the United States, but it, it follows the trend of Christians across the Middle East. As um, the rise of Islamism has, has been more felt, uh, Christians have basically fled, whether it's from Iraq, whether from Syria. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, they tend not to, in, in Lebanon it's different, but they tend not to, uh, you know, form militias and, and fight, but it's easier to go to the West where they have family, where they have religious, where they have cultural connections. Um, so certainly uh, in the Gaza Strip, it hasn't been all that comfortable. There was a, a Christian bookstore owner who, who was murdered, and I believe his bookstore was burned. So there have been occasional violence. Generally, Christian Palestinians are not attacked, um, but uh, you do have instances, including the West Bank and the Second Intifada, where um, where the Church of the Nativity was used by by uh, Fatah terrorists as as a base, and, and you know, there was a whole siege in that place as well. So um, it's certainly you know Christians tend to say that they feel caught up in a fight between other people, you know, between Israel and and, and these uh, radical Muslim groups. Um, but they they're generally are patriotic Pal uh, Palestinians. Um, you know, there there have been Palestinian even terrorist groups that were founded by Christians in the sixties and seventies at the height of the of the secular uh, terrorist groups, the PFLP. Um, but in yeah, in general, uh, Palestinian Christians, you know, when there's a lot of pressure on them, uh, they tend to to you know to pick up and leave to other places, which is a great you know uh, cultural loss and um, and a loss in many other ways as well. Mind you, most of the Christians in Israel are Arabs as well. There are some very ancient communities, and a quite diverse community in Israel. Um, and it's a very interesting question, a complex relationship with the state. Um, but they are, you know, they're Israeli citizens and, and, and do have their own voice and their own story. All right, thank you for that, Laser. And let's, um, I'll have a, a couple of uh, people whose hands are raised and we'll call on you. And so uh, if you're a student, um, please just introduce yourself and tell us what campus you're from. If you're a community member, if you want to just tell us uh, what city you're in and introduce yourself. And uh, let's start with Jessica Nershel. Jessica, go ahead and unmute yourself and please ask your question. Hi, um, I'm Jessica. I'm from the University of Connecticut. Um, I went on Hasbara this summer. It was amazing. Um, thank you for being here, Laser. And um, my question is, how will the war affect the different areas in the West Bank? Interesting question. Um, so, so far, uh, the West Bank has been rather quiet. There's been um, a few, uh, you probably read about in the news, there's been, there was a shooting attack a few days ago um, where an Israeli father was killed. There was an operation today in Tokarim. Generally, it's been quiet. Uh, Hamas called for and wanted nothing more than the Palestinians in the West Bank to rise up and, you know, and flood Israeli towns as well. Um, Israel is certainly trying to make sure that that can't happen. You know that there can't be terrorists from from Tokarim who go to Kfar Saba or something like that. 
but generally it's been quiet. Long term, if Israel succeeds, wipes out Hamas in Gaza. Um, the biggest threat to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is Hamas as well. Um, Hamas would like nothing more than to rule the West Bank as well. So that would be good for the Palestinian Authority. I think it will also bring renewed attention and energy into attempts to move forward on some sort of political process in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Um, again, you heard that from the U.S. administration that at the end, they want Israel to eliminate Hamas, but then they would like to see more effort and energy put into the uh, into some sort of peace process. So I think long term, it could be beneficial um, in terms of investment, in terms of, of, of getting out of the stalemate. Um, but again, that's on the condition that Israel wins. If Israel is forced to stop or loses its will at some point, that only strengthens Hamas, and that is terrible for everybody. Okay, let's go to Ariel Schultz. Ariel, if you can unmute yourself and ask, introduce yourself and ask your question. Um, hi, my name is Ariel, uh, a student at Brandeis University. I went on one of the high rock trips last winter. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, there's a lot of questions related to what's going to happen uh, in Gaza. I'm, I'm wondering, um, how do you think um, Mahmoud Abbas's health and if he eventually passes away, um, let's say before the war would end, how that might affect, you know, control of Gaza being handed to the PA, what like the future with the PA looks like? I'm wondering about that. It's a great question. It's a question that that was on people's minds before this. I mean, I've, I, what's on everyone's mind now is, is Gaza. But uh, it, yeah, the question of what happens the day after Abbas. Um, listen, Abbas is no friend of Israel, friend of the Jews. Uh, it's a, he has a PhD in Holocaust denial, and, and he gave a speech in August where he was uh, blaming Jews for the Holocaust and all this stuff, as he does occasionally. But uh, he has long ago foregone violence and, and is good in that way. Um, it took him a while to even condemn the October 7th attacks, but eventually he was kind of forced to do so by the U.S. Um, so he's no sympathetic character, but he's okay as far as far as these type of leaders go. Um, I think listen, it, it could, once, he, once he's gone, he's old, he's in his late 80s, um, it could lead to some sort of uh, internal fighting, which I don't think would be good for anybody, but there are some characters who are quite uh, reasonable <coughs> Um, and I think would be beneficial. So Mohammed Dahlan, who was a security chief for the PA, very corrupt, all these guys are, but um, I think it's someone that Israel would be comfortable with. He's kind of a strongman type um, who seems to have, have moved beyond any support for terrorism. Um, Marwan Barghouti is in Israeli prison for, um, so for uh, fatal terror attacks. He's probably the most popular, if there was a, an election now, he would probably win, but he's in Israeli prison. So the question is, if he was willing to commit to fight against terrorism, would Israel, was, is, would Israel let him out? Possibly, possibly. And then there's other people, uh, the interior, interior minister of the PA, uh, he doesn't have much support in polls, but he's seen as someone who's, you know, he's a, he's a party functionary, but he's seen someone as quite, as quite reasonable by, by Israel and by the West. Um, so those are the possibilities. I don't think it would get in the way of the PA getting control of Gaza in the long run, and it might even uh, be a good thing, because with Abbas, you know you're really not going to move toward a real peace. He's not going to make peace with Israel. Um, you know, he's been running all these campaigns and in international bodies to try to get Israel, you know, in front of the Court of Justice, Hague, and all that. But um, I think once he's gone, I think it opens up some some real space for some progress. And Israel, thank you for that. And we have, uh, I see four hands up, and we have 10 minutes to go here. So I'm going to try to uh, see if we can answer them as quickly as possible uh, here later. And let's go to Josh uh, in Indiana. Josh, if you want to introduce yourself, please, and go ahead and ask your question. I think we have a technical, oh, Josh, I think you unmuted yourself and... All right, Josh, we'll let you troubleshoot for a second and we'll go to Talia Siegel while you uh, uh, restart your Zoom there. Uh, Talia, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Talia Siegel. I go to Georgia Tech. Um, thanks for being here, Laser. Uh, my question is, I have this impression that 
there are a lot of very well-intentioned but uninformed people who are mostly concerned with the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So how do we convince them that one, the strictly humanitarian lens is too narrow, and two, that Israel in fact has humanitarian interests in mind? Sure. Um, I think first of all, you know, this doesn't this didn't happen in a, a vacuum, as the UN uh, chief said. That let's not forget that you know, fourteen hundred Israelis were butchered, mm-hmm. raped, and all that, and Israel not only has a right to, but has a responsibility to, uh, as a state, uh, get rid of the threat. The uh, anything that happens, you know, to the humanitarian humanitarian situation in Gaza, uh, is a direct result of this. It's not Israel's interest. Israel's interest is to have Gaza, the Gaza Strip, be like uh, Singapore. Be is uh, nothing would help Israel more than a rich Gaza Strip that has, you know, that is not a terror threat, that has investment, that is peaceful, that is richer than Israel. I'm sure uh, Israelis would love to invest in that. Would love to go to the beaches. Um, by the way, on, when Israel, before the Oslo Accords, when Israel was controlling the Gaza Strip, Gaza Strip was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It was basically gone under the Egyptians to one that didn't have really modern water, electricity, or anything like that, to uh, starting to modernize. Um, and when Israel pulled everyone out in 2005, all the troops and all the civilians, they left the greenhouses. The, the idea was that, okay, now there'll be some space for some real trade. We know what happened. The greenhouses were burned, the synagogues were burned, uh, Hamas took over by force. Even with Hamas firing rockets all the time and terrorist attacks and everything, there were still 20,000 Gazans working in Israel. 20,000 Gazans means, means over 100,000 people being supported by that. They were being checked by Israelis, uh, risking their lives so that there would be this trade. Israel was trying to increase that. All the water, not all the water, a lot of water, a lot of electricity was supplied by Israel as well, which is not under no responsibility to do. Um, during the war, yeah, it's more complex, um, but we have to, let's not forget, Egypt has a border that it controls with the Gaza Strip. Um, there, it can do what it wants at that border. Um, it's certainly in Israel's interest that in the southern Gaza Strip, uh, civilians are as well fed and, and as safe as possible. Isra- you've seen Israeli troops try to create this corridor, risking mm-hmm. their own lives, get fired on by Hamas when they're trying to let people go south. So even if you're talking to someone that thinks Israeli, Israelis are monsters, um, the Israeli soldiers just want to kill people. I'd say it's in their interest to have a safe place that civilians can go. The, the fewer civilians get killed, the less pressure is on Israel uh, in the world. I'll also say this, though. I've spoken to, and this is no secret, Gazans who were in Israel on October 7th because they were getting surgery in Israeli hospitals. Okay, At no cost to them, Israeli doctors taking their own time, using Israeli taxpayer money, taking up beds that could go to Israelis. Right, Israel has a shortage of hospitals like a lot of countries. Um, why would Israel be caring for sick Gazans and sick Gazan children if it didn't care about the humanitarian aspect of it? Right? This is not easy. It's not cheap to give heart surgery to Israeli ki- uh, to Gazan kids. Uh, these doctors could be doing surgery on Israeli citizens, Israeli taxpayers. Nope, they're taking Gazans, and this has gone on for years, uh, including relatives of Hamas leaders, by the way. So uh, I think there's Israel has a lot to be proud of in terms of. Uh, showing its care for the humanitarian situation. At the same time, um, it was a basically a statelet run by a terrorist organization, and it had to. We've seen what Hamas has done with everything that goes in. Pipes for water become bombs. Fuel for hospitals become a uh, fuel for their their tunnels and fuel for weapons. So, um, in a very difficult situation, I think Israel has acted like any other Western country uh, would have, and even more so. I don't think a lot of Western countries would be doing giving surgery in their hospitals uh, for the kids of a state that is actively at war with it. Thank you for that. And we'll go just to our last question here. And, I, and we have quite a few of them in the chat. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, but I, I encourage those who didn't get to ask their question, we'll try to put you first in line for the next uh, the next briefing here. But we'll go to Josh here to close us out with the last question in, in Bloomington. Josh, if you could introduce yourself and go ahead. Hi, how are you? Yeah, you, you can see the you can see the flag. I'm in Blooming. My name is Josh Krudup. Uh, I go to IU. I'm a senior. Um, I'm a vice president for Who Just for Israel. I was on a Hasbro 
fellowship this summer. Um, so you actually answered my question. So I'll ask a follow-up question. The question that I was going to ask is that, who do you think would administer Gaza? So the PA, I was going to ask if they have any le leaders, moderate leaders to, um, you know, to have not the, 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 the radical ideology they have now. So I guess my, my follow-up question is how do you, how do you destroy such a radical ideology among a people? Um, and do you think that there is a, is there a, a, a um, an out of the box way to try to, I don't know, like destroy that ideology through maybe, uh, like, 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 like from like a religious standpoint or like a religious kind of diplomacy, um, because I uh, you can see with like ISIS and things like that, it's very hard to eradicate something someone who thinks so ideologically. So. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great question. Uh, yesterday, um, Netanyahu was talking about denazification of the Gaza Strip. Um, obviously, Germany was a place that was mostly very uh, supportive of the Nazi ideology. And then you fast forward not that much later, and it's you know one of the strongest democracies in the world. I don't think that's relevant for the Gaza Strip. I, I, I would disagree with the prime minister on that. I don't think it's possible. I don't think Israel can control what Gazans think. Uh, it's, I don't think Israel should. I don't think Israel is going to get involved in that. Um, I think it's a responsibility for Palestinian society to decide, and Palestinian leaders to decide. You know, if they want to be working like the other Arab countries in the region that have that are going on a path of uh, religious tolerance and, and prosperity, and you know, more rights for women and and, and modernizing. And, you know, people that have been to UAE and, and Bahrain, and even the Saudis are really moving in this direction, which is unthinkable a few years ago. Um, I, so, you know, I can't control what someone else thinks. I, um, what Israel's focus now is in destroying the capabilities of them. Um, but I think the international community certainly has a responsibility because what was being taught in a lot of UN schools um, was stuff that, you know, was straight up hatred and anti-Semitism. And, and, you know, and that was funded by European countries in America. And that really needs to, we have to make sure that uh, when the schools are open again and when they're rebuilt, uh, there's a they're teaching something different. It's a different curriculum. They can be as proudly Palestinian as they want. That's great. I'm, I'm all for people who are proud of who they are um, and, and to build their own countries. Um, but it can't be done by teaching you know that that, that Israel is not legitimate, that the Jews aren't aren't really from here, or, or you know, that, that they're responsible for all the bad things in the world and that stuff. That's that can't be allowed to happen again because some that obviously we've seen the result of that kind of education on October 7th. Azure, thank you for that, and thank you for for really for taking the time and and everything you've you've taught us here. And um, I uh, I want to just take a, a moment also just to to let everybody know here um, <clears throat> that uh, if I can make a public service announcement on behalf of of Hasbara, um, we we have a mission to Israel scheduled uh, for December twenty fourth, and uh, that has not been canceled, and we're not planning on canceling. Uh, we'll of course take every security precaution uh, necessary. It's possible that. That it looks a little, the dates may have to be adjusted according to the war. Certainly, uh, what we do in Israel will be different than what those of you who are Hasbro fellows different from what you experienced. But, um, but we we do plan on going and, and think it's an important thing to to do here in solidarity uh, with Israel. And so, for the students on on the call here, please tell your friends and and if laser, if you're available. We'll meet with you like like we did last time, uh, which I, I won't hold you to, uh, won't make you commit to that right this second because I know you've got a, a war to cover and a lot to do. Um, but uh, but I, I did want to just let everybody know that, and I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day, and um, I'll just let Laser close it out here with if there's anything you want to uh, to leave us with. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone again. Uh, you guys do great work and even heroic work and and it does not go unnoticed we you know in israel people do pay attention to what goes on in the college campuses and uh it's not anything that we can do and i know how challenging it can be and when you're in israel you have you know, the whole country and the army behind you and you guys are you feel kind of alone but keep fighting that fight it's very important uh israel can't do uh what it needs to do without without having the support of the united states so on college campuses and, and you know, to your congress people and all that stuff so important um feel free to reach out to me um, you know, through the Times Visual website, or I have no problem. Uh, I don't know if you've given up my email address. If you have any further questions, happy to remain in touch, and hopefully, I'll see you uh, when you come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laser, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a good day. Thanks again. <laughs>